Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our third reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus spoke to them another parable. The realm of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed with three measures of wheat flour until the whole batch was leavened. In these human words, God's voice is heard. please pray with me. Let there be peace among us, and let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says to seek first the realm of God. And while all of the Gospels talk about the realm of God or the kingdom of God, the basileia of God in the Greek, which is, basileia is a word that means empire. And so when we're talking about God's empire, that means we're using the word ironically. And so the kingdom of God or the kingdom of God, that is unlike the kingdoms of the world. That is unlike empire. In empire, you have power over. 
and God's empire there's power with. <laughs> there's no emperor in God's empire, you see. And so it's an anti-empire. It's a counter-kingdom. It's a counter-cultural uh, expectation. And so we hear about this kingdom of God, this commonwealth of God, this realm of God, and it is unlike the power structures of the world that says who can and can't be part of things, who can be in and, and who has to stay out, who gets the benefits and who doesn't. In God's kingdom, the last are first and the first are last, and everyone has sacred value. In God's kingdom, we see Jesus going about healing all who are sick and oppressed. In God's kingdom, there is no such thing as untouchable or unlovable. And so throughout the Gospels, we hear about this kingdom of God, this anti-empire of God, this counter-kingdom of God. And Matthew... When he talks about it, he uses two phrases and he uses them interchangeably. In Matthew's gospel, he talks about the kingdom of God or the realm of God and the realm of heaven interchangeably, the same thing. And why not? In literary imagination, where does God live? God lives in heaven. In fact, also on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus prays, Abba, who art in heaven. But in the Aramaic language, which would be the language that Jesus spoke, that phrase doesn't imply that God is in some sky city far away. No, God in heaven doesn't mean God in the attic. It doesn't mean God in the penthouse. It doesn't mean God way upstairs. No, it means God throughout the universe. God in the heavens, the cosmos, which is everything. God throughout the entire universe is what creator which art in heaven, God who art in heaven, Abba in heaven. It means God throughout the universe. In other words, there's not a spot where God is not. God in heaven means God everywhere fully present. God in heaven, heaven just means where God is. Well, where is God? Everywhere. So, no wonder Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, in our hands, present to us. The gospel of Jesus is the good news of God's kingdom. The good news that God is present, and because that is true, we are meant to cooperate with God's presence to make our world more heavenly. That being true, we are then called to care for one another. To be merciful to refugees, the sick, the hurting, the oppressed, the marginalized. Sometimes we will see something terrible. We'll see terrible wars. We will see terrible violence. We'll see terrible diseases. We'll see terrible crime. We'll see oppression. We'll see people being squashed. We'll see people being, being denied the right to vote or the right to housing or the right to work or the right to serve or in some places even the right to exist for who they are. And we will sometimes say, how can God allow this? And I can't help but imagine God is asking the same question. How can you allow this? If God is everywhere, then we who call ourselves the people of God are to see God everywhere. Everywhere we look. And if we see God in refugees, we won't abandon them. How could we abandon God? In fact, it is traditionally, it is historically the Christian view that we who serve Christ do so by seeing Christ in those who are hurting. And so uh, Mother Teresa said she saw Jesus in the poor. We are to see what is holy, that which is sacred. The Quakers talk about that of God in every person. We are to see God in everyone, especially the so-called least and lowly. What is the whole point of this narrative of God somehow being embodied, incarnated in human flesh, and that human flesh just happened to be born in a barn? That that human flesh just happened to have to be a refugee shortly thereafter in Egypt. That that human flesh just happened to sometimes have no place to lay his head. That that human flesh was in fact uh, executed the way that runaway slaves were executed. The whole point of incarnational theology is seeing God in the midst of suffering and responding like God would to it. If we see God in people of all religions and no religion, 
We won't use religion as an excuse to abuse or vilify those who have different religious vocabularies than we do. If we see God in the sick, we will not rest until every person has adequate medical care. This last week in this country, I don't think many of us got much rest. Because if we see God in the sick, we can't rest until every person has adequate medical care. If we see God in same gender loving people, if we see God in transgender people, if we see God in gender non-conforming people, then we will not remain silent when they are demonized and dehumanized. We certainly will not remain silent when those who risk their lives to defend us are attacked from within our own country. God's heaven is God's home, and God lives in us, with us, among us, all of us, no matter who we are. God in heaven is God right here. God in heaven is God with us. We then serve God by being God's hands of mercy in the world. God's realm, God's heaven is at hand. In our hands. That's hard to hear sometimes. That means that we have a lot of responsibility and we so would rather just live in our platitudes or by ignoring the difficulties. But God's heaven is in us. And so for God's heavenly grace to flow, it has to flow through us. God lives in us, with us, among us, all of us, no matter who we are. God in heaven is God right here. God's heaven is in our hands. But when we really believe that, what should that look like in our lives? It turns out that Jesus has a lot to say about that. Jesus had a lot to say about oppression. Jesus had a lot to say about poverty. Jesus had a lot to say about sick people. God had a lot to, Jesus had a lot to say about outcast. Jesus had a lot to say and his mouth got him in a lot of trouble. The government said, you're being too political, shut up. The religious people said, you aren't being orthodox enough, shut up. And he forgot to shut up. And he got in trouble with everybody. But if you are called to make a difference in the world, that is not being called to shut up. Sometimes people say, why do you push us so hard? Why, don't you know that some of us are disagree with you? Well, you get to. And how you know that you disagree with me is because I let you know where I stand. That's how we know. <laughs> And I promise you that I did not go to nine years of graduate school and have a student loan debt that rivals my mortgage to be quiet. <laughs> if I know it, you get to know it. You get to disagree with it, but you're going to hear it. God's realm is in our hands. And Jesus spends all of Matthew chapter 13 telling us what he thinks that should look like. We can disagree with him, or we can disagree with Matthew's version of what Matthew thought he stood for. But if we're going to be a church, we have to hear what the gospel says. We get to wrestle with it. We get to not enjoy it. We get to not agree with it. We get to wonder uh, if it's being presented in the way that is best, but we've got to hear it. And so, in Matthew 13, if we were to hear all of Matthew 13, we would have hear, heard Jesus telling parable after parable. These stories, this, these fictional stories meant to convey important truths about the realm of heaven. And so we would hear Jesus says, the realm of heaven is like a field with both wheat and weeds. The farmer of the field decides to let the wheat and weeds grow together and will separate the weeds and the wheat at harvest time. But in the meantime, the wheat and the weeds, they just all grow together in unity, in the same place at the same time, different. Not even necessarily uh, cooperating with each other or being good for each other in every way, but they are together. Don't separate them now. Let them be together. Jesus says the realm of heaven is like a tiny mustard seed that is planted but becomes a big plant that can actually house the birds of the air. Jesus says the realm of heaven, and this is what Reverend Ann read to us today from Matthew 13, the realm of heaven is like a woman. That's another thing, P.S., that the realm of heaven is like a lot of things, and sometimes what the, the, the example is like a woman. A misogynistic church needs to hear that. The realm of heaven is like a woman who is doing some stuff. 
She's like a woman baking bread who just keeps adding yeast to the dough until her entire loaf rises. We're all meant to rise together. Jesus says the realm of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea and they caught all kinds of fish. And the fishers waited until they got to the shore to separate the fish they wanted from the ones that needed to be discarded. Jesus says the realm of heaven is like a field with hidden treasure in it. Jesus just keeps reaching for metaphors and similes and symbols to help describe what it should look like when we accept that our lives are part of God's life. When we live as if we are in God's presence, we let wheat and weeds grow together. Maybe you're the wheat and I'm the weeds, but we get to be together because in God's realm, we live and let live. We don't need to keep people from voting. We don't need to keep people from marrying. We don't need to keep people from accessing education or healthcare. We don't need to keep people from serving their country. Later, the farmer, God, can decide who is and isn't worthy of God's best. And I believe that God will decide that we all deserve the very best. But our job is to let everything grow and thrive. When we live as if we are in God's presence, we may feel like our resources are small, like a little mustard seed. We may have just a little faith, just a little talent, just a little money, just a few friends, just a small community. But the truth remains that within us is great potential. A mustard seed can become a plant that can house the birds. Small as we may feel, we can provide shelter, respite, hope, community to those who are in flight, those who are flying through life, look for a place to land. When we live as if we are in God's presence, we keep adding ingredients to the mix. We keep adding programs and messages and music and food and outreach and education. We keep adding yeast until the whole loaf rises, giving everyone a chance to thrive and be part of abundant living. When we live as if we are in God's presence, our lives may seem like a big empty field, but there is treasure hidden in that field, even if we haven't uncovered it yet. When we live as if we are in God's presence, we cast a wide net, bringing in every kind of person to affirm their sacred value. Some will stay and some will not, but the net was cast for everyone. The realm of heaven The kingdom of God, the presence of God is where everyone has a chance. Everyone is to be fed, not only if they deserve it, not only if they believe certain things, not only if they live up to our standards. No, the only requirement in the kingdom of God, the only requirement for being fed is being hungry. In the realm of heaven, everyone deserves shelter. Everyone has sacred value. Every life is a field with hidden treasure in it. Robert and I have a new member of our family. Her name is Bella. And Bella has already learned one of our favorite affirmations. With her actions, with her staring at the kitchen countertop, sometimes from the top down, that really annoys Robert. with her sniffing at the refrigerator door, with her going to her food and water bowls, with her performing her tricks that are rewarded with treats, Bella is saying over and over, there is good for me and I ought to have it. (laughs) Bella already knows what I hope to always remember and what I hope you will at least consider. In God's presence, There is good for us, and we ought to have it. And if that's true for us, it's true for everyone. It is true for Syrians. It is true for Russians. It is true for transgender people. It is true for people struggling to stay alive. It is true for people who are chronically depressed. It is true for gay and lesbian people. It is true for women. It is true for everyone, if it is true at all. There is good for us, and we ought to have it. And if that is true for everyone, part of how we worship is by being conduits through which God's good can flow. The Apostle Paul tells us this morning in that epistle to the Romans that even when we don't know how to pray, 
even when things are hard, even when we, we, we're confused and overwhelmed and depressed and exhausted and we don't even know what to do next. We've got compassion fatigue. We've got movement fatigue. We have got, we have got resistance fatigue. We have got all kinds of fatigue on top of trying to pay the bills and on top of trying to stay healthy and still on top of working on our relationships. Sometimes we are just exhausted. We don't even know what we need, much less how to pray for it. And Paul says that when we are in that state, there is this little thing to encourage us. The Spirit is praying in and for us. The energy, the presence, the love, the power of God is in us, praying in and for us. Our groanings of despair become the language with which the Spirit prays. Our groanings are God's own prayer, wishing us peace and comfort and strength and joy. In other words, there is good for us, and we ought to have it. And even when we forget that, God is still knowing that for us and whispering that truth into our hearts. The realm of heaven is knowing without fail that there is good for us, and we ought to have it. There is good for all people, and all people ought to have it. And when we live as if we believe we are part of God's heaven, then we will choose to be God's helpers, whereby the good is joyously shared so that every need can be met. We pray to God, and God prays in us. We can be the answer to God's prayers when we help more people experience the good they deserve to have. And this is the good news. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.